I sent Krampus a letter when I was young. A few days later, I received a response. My son is about nine and a half years old now, and I have no doubt that he is the joy of my life. My wife died a few years back, so it's just been me and him. I've worked hard to make up for the fact that he doesn't have a mother anymore, and I feel glad to see that he's just like any other boy his age. Happy, gleeful, innocent, but the story I'm about to write has nothing to do with him. He did, however, help me remember it. For some context, I've always been uneasy during Christmas time, and I only really started to celebrate it when my wife, on her deathbed, told me to make sure our son would always have a grand Christmas. She died on Christmas Eve, and every year since then, I've always made sure to go all out on Christmas. It's the only way I know I can make this time of year easier for my son and for myself. I could never remember why the holiday joy of old Saint Nick was something I never liked or looked forward to. But a few days ago my son announced that he would be writing his own letter to Santa Claus and as he scampered up the stairs and into his room to do just that, I felt myself freeze mid-sip of my drink. The mug slipped from my hand and shattered against the floor below my stiff hand. That's when it all came back to me, something I myself had forgotten, but my bones and subconscious certainly had not, something which had terrified me so badly that upon remembering it, I became as still as a marble statue. The following is a recounting of what my son made me remember. The event in question took place when I was 11, and was finishing the fifth grade. A blessed time I should say. Puberty had yet to hit, and I was without a care in the world. Well, almost. You see, there was this boy in my school. His name is still engraved in my mind. Timothy Herzmauser, but everyone called him Tim. Tim was nearly a foot taller than me, as he had been held back twice. And he was, as you've probably guessed by now, the stereotypical bully, always looking to cause trouble at every corner. Sound innocent? Well, by adult standards, it really was. A push here, a shove there, and insults sprinkled on top. Just little things that can be brushed over. For 11-year-old me, though, he was evil incarnate, worse than serial killers or terrorists. I think that's the part that insults me the most about this memory. He was just a bad kid, not a bad person. And what happened makes me feel just so much more guilty. It all came to a breaking point when one day, the day before Christmas break started, I was writing my letter to Santa Claus. I was a bit embarrassed because I was at the age where writing letters to Santa Claus wasn't really seen as something that was acceptable anymore. I thought of myself as being a year too old to still write him, but I did so nonetheless. I was sitting on a bench near the school playground during recess, as oblivious to my surroundings as can be, writing my letter with a smile on my face, when all of a sudden it was snatched away from my mittened hands. I looked up and saw Tim waving the letter up and over his head, shouting at everyone about what I was doing. The embarrassment I felt at that moment has yet to be matched, even now, nearly 30 years later. I got angry and charged at him, but that pubescent boy had no trouble shoving me to the ground like a rag doll. I laid on the tarmac, crying both out of pain and out of embarrassment, but mostly the latter. I don't remember much about what happened afterwards. All I remember is that when I came home, I rushed up the stairs to my room, just like my son did, and slammed the door shut. Night had fallen when I opened my eyes, and I was sitting on my desk, a pen in my right hand and an unfinished letter before me. The only word on it was dear. Around me on the floor were countless crumpled up balls of paper, and I remembered that I had been writing the most hateful letters to Santa about Tim, asking old Saint Nick to give him a fat truckload of coal for Christmas, but I would end up crumpling each on up and starting anew. As I stared at the blank piece of paper, only one thing came to mind. I wrote after dear the only word that wouldn't make me crumple this letter up. Krampus. The letter went as so. Dear Krampus, this Christmas I want a present only you can give. I know you punish bad kids, and I know one kid who is the baddest of them all. His name is Timothy Herzmauser, and he is a bully in my school who bullies me every day. Santa giving him coal isn't enough for me. I want him gone and punished. That is all I want for Christmas this year. From Sam. I put it in an envelope and marked it with my address and a dozen post stamps. When it came to the delivery address, I wrote South Pole because, with my little kid logic, I surmised that since Krampus is the polar opposite of Santa, that must mean that he lives in the other pole. I ran out, nearly trampling my little sister, who was two years younger than me, and rushed outside where I dropped my letter in the outgoing mailbox. Life went on after that, and I forgot about that letter. I admit that this post has been sparse on details thus far, but you have to understand that 30 years erodes one's memory quite a bit. But even so, I will never forget the day I got that letter in my mailbox. On that day, I vaguely remember my mother telling me to go pick up the mail outside, or was it my father, and the closer I get to my mailbox in my head, the stronger the memory becomes. I opened the mailbox, and among our usual mail, I found the oddest of letters. My memory of this is the strongest and most vivid. I still remember how the rough parchment caressed the skin of my small hands, and how the beautiful wax seal of an onyx black candle greeted me. I stopped paying attention to the world around me, wholly hypnotized by the letter. I opened it where I stood, and the memory of me writing my letter to him came back in an instant as I read what this letter contained. Words with beautiful, but hard to decipher, handwriting streaked across a vellum surface. I read each and every one in, and doing so, I burned those wretched things in my mind like a true Christmas curse. Dear Samuel, my frozen heart within my furry chest was thawed by your letter. I hardly ever receive any correspondence here in the South Pole, and it really does get quite lonely where I reside. I leapt up with joy and clacked my hooves when one of my helping elves brought me your letter. Of course, Samuel, of course I shall get rid of that nasty Timothy Herzmauser for you. I shall ensure that a good little lad like you will never have to be bothered by the likes of a boy like him ever again. 
dearly yours, K-R-A-M-P-U-S. The signature was horrendous, but also beautiful. If I had to compare it to something, it would be as if Mozart or Beethoven were stricken by a seizure mid-performance, but they still continued to play, producing a beautifully vile sound as their genius would not allow for anything less. The date was December the 16th, 1992. I'm ashamed to say that I hadn't understood the gravity of my actions. But then again, what the hell was I expecting? I was high on bravado, too old to be frightened by my terrible actions and too old to have thought twice before doing it. The days flew by, one by one like the ticks of a grandfather clock. Christmas Eve finally came. December 24th, 1992. I could have stayed in bed and slept through everything, but I just had to see him. I would do what no one had ever dared to do, I would catch a glimpse of Krampus. My plan was perfect. Well, the living room arrangement was perfect, so to speak. You see, my living room was a tad small, which is why it was arranged the way it was. It was located on the second floor of my house, connected with the kitchen and with windows that faced the front yard. If you climbed down from the third floor to the second floor, you'd find yourself in the living room, with an open doorway that led to the kitchen on your left. Between the stairs and the wall on your right was a large television which sat on a large TV bench. Opposite the television was a fireplace where we'd hung our stockings, and right next to it was a grand Christmas tree that we had all carefully decorated as a family on the first day of December. My plan was to hide behind the TV, and wait for Krampus to come. I don't remember if I actually planned to confront him or not. The next strong memory I have is sitting on the floor behind the TV. The gentle fire gave me light so I wouldn't be frightened by the dark. I sat for who knows how long, dozing in and out. My memory gets hazy here, but then, like the flashing click of a camera, a memory as clear as pure spring water comes to mind. Something which made me sober out of my sleep at the drop of a hat and pay close attention as if I was hearing the final words of a dying man. What on earth are you doing here? A whispered shout echoed. I jerked awake, and felt a jolt of adrenaline course through my body. The voice that answered the question is one that made my skin crawl as if my muscles had excreted maggots. Imagine if the deepest voice you can think of spoke while sharpening a knife against jagged rocks so that each stroke matched with every syllable spoken by them. That's the best way I can describe the voice that I heard. I was invited here, brother, Krampus spoke, and to this day I wonder how I was able to keep my bladder and bowls full. Just remembering it as an adult sends shivers down my spine, let alone being 11 years old. Bullshit. The other voice shouted in a whisper. I heard the sound of paper rustling, and a deafening silence ensued. Why you, the kind voice said, he has no idea what he has done and you know damn well of as much. Maybe so, the gravelly voice of iron groaned, but still, it would, in fact, be quite rude if I let it go unanswered, do you not agree? Leave, the kind voice demanded. Now now, dear brother, there is no such need for you to become impatient. The voice was shaking my insides as though I'd swallowed a speaker playing heavy metal. I will leave in due time. I just not with this present. The hell you are, and who are you to say that? Sleep was tightening its grip on me, which is why I miss the next part. Out of the both of us, Santa said, only my hands hold a present. Your claws grip something that is only punishment and nothing else. I can tell as much, and I refuse to let you leave whatever vile atrocity you've wrapped under this fine fir tree lest I be struck dead by the screams and fright you shamelessly wish to incite. This is your last chance to leave brother, or I promise to use force if you still insist on being a stubborn mule. A soft chuckle from Krampus pierced the air, and I felt as though I'd been dropped in the middle of the Arctic Ocean while my feet were stuck in a block of concrete. Now now brother, Krampus said as gently as his voice would allow, let things not get as ugly as they did back in March 1888 or in November 1940, especially now during the month of joy. You wouldn't want to ruin your very own holiday, would you? The hushed arguing continued, and I gradually found myself falling deeper and deeper into sleep, no longer able to fight it. I collapsed on the floor and blacked out. I awoke to shrill shrieks stabbing my eardrums. My mother was standing in front of the tree, dropped presents she most likely wanted to put under it now scattered all throughout the floor like neglected toys. When the police came, and I told them my story, and showed them the letter, they believed me. Just not in the way I hoped. They surmised that my letter had been intercepted by some sick bastard and he'd taken it upon himself to take on the role of Krampus. I had heard him have a mental breakdown in my living room, his mind completely disconnected from reality. They never did find him as they promised, or the rest of Tim. But I do remember one thing, which although it is the haziest, it also the one that scarred me the most. As I collapsed on the floor from exhaustion on that night, in the brief period before my eyes collapsed shut, I saw through the gap between the TV, bench and the floor a pair of thick snow boots facing a pair of blackened and rough hooves, a drop of blood falling down on the floor in front of the fire and in front of me before my eyes slammed shut. 